Defense, our ongoing series on water quality examines a new way that farmers are planting crops. We'll learn about no-till farming and how it keeps nutrients in place and out of Vermont's waterways. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Many farmers like the phrase tried and true. It means that what they're doing is working and is predictable. But to remain profitable and improve the environment, farmers are now moving away from what they've always known and are doing more with less. Across the fences, Keith Silva takes us to Bridport to learn about no-till planting. How did you hear about no-till planting? Wow. How did we hear about no-till planting? This is an evolution that's been going on for a long time. You know, 50 years ago, the focus on agriculture was efficiency. And boy, did we do a heck of a job. 3,000 acres. Marie Onda and her family operate one of the largest dairy farms in Vermont, Blue Spruce Farm in Bridport. They milk 1,500 cows and manage 3,000 acres of cropland. Always looking to innovate and improve, the Audettes are planting 40% of this year's corn crop using a practice called no-till. If it doesn't look like much, you're starting to catch on. Erosion is the biggest culprit that is affecting our soil health. It's also the biggest culprit that's bringing phosphorus and other sediments into the waterways. So if we can resolve the issue of erosion, on our farms and across the state and every piece of land, we will resolve the water quality issues. No-till is basically not tilling the soil or tilling it less. So if your soil is staying put, the nutrients are staying put. When a field is tilled, the soil is disturbed. Tilling ensures good seed to soil contact but it also fractures the soil structure and makes it more susceptible to erosion and nutrient runoff. No-till equipment cuts a thin slit in the soil in order to plant seeds and leaves the rest of the ground undisturbed. With increased pressure from regulatory agencies on farmers to reduce phosphorus coming off their land, the practice of no-till planting is gaining acceptance. We have long prided ourselves on being the very best stewards of our land. And like every other business, every other industry, it evolves. The science evolves, information knowledge evolves. And the practices that we used to take 50 years ago aren't sustainable. And we don't farm the way we did then. You don't even farm the same way you did 10 years ago. You're right. You could. In five years, we've, changed, we've made so many changes. It's phenomenal. Who, who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Seen side by side, the differences between a no-till field and a conventionally tilled field are striking. And it's not only farmers who are noticing. Farmers um, are getting questions from their neighbors about, oh, did you not plant any corn this year? Or, you know, why, did you, why is that hay field dead and you're not doing anything with it? So now that the corn is growing, I think those questions will be answered. But yes. Kirsten Workman is a University of Vermont Extension agronomist. For the past few years, she's been testing reduced tillage practices to help farmers transition to no-till planting. There's been a lot of attention put on reducing tillage because reducing tillage typically means reducing erosion. And with all the water quality issues that we've been seeing in Lake Champlain, it's been pretty clear that we need to reduce erosion so we can reduce nutrients and sediments from going into the lake. And by stopping tilling, that's a really great way to do that. <laughs> In addition to research, Workman and her colleagues host an annual no-till and cover crop symposium. We have to go towards no -till and we One of the featured speakers at this year's conference was Odette Menard from the Quebec Ministry of Agriculture. In her talk, she urged farmers to rely less on what's worked in the past and focus more on what's happening today. If we have to reinvent the system, we should be looking, we should be studying this new system and not always comparing it to something that was working a hundred years ago. The new system, it has to live with the new reality. And the new reality is we have to look at the soil from a very different point of view. And therefore, uh, I think that when we talk about water quality, we should always look at it from a different point of view also. How is it that we can manage the water, the agricultural system, to make more out of it? 
Even though more Vermont farmers are embracing no-till practices, that doesn't mean they're used to them. The no-till fields, they don't look as clean and shiny. That's where we have to rely on the science. We have to get past, you know, we've done it this way, it's how we've always done it. You know, my dad has been driving around, he was a farmer his whole life, and he's in his 80s now, and he's noticing this shift. But he's proud of us, he's proud that we can evolve into something different. Besides its look, another difference of a no-till field can be in how much feed it yields. And that's something workmen are on debt will keep a close eye on throughout the season. What we are seeing in Vermont is you may not see a huge yield bump right away. We hope you don't see a big yield drop. We're trying to avoid that on the bottom end. What we're finding is that our no-till fields are just much more consistent. So when it's dry, they don't see drought stress. When it's sopping wet and we get 20 inches of rain in June, they seem to deal with that situation better. So we're starting to hear farmers say the soil is functioning better. It infiltrates water better and it also and drains better but also holds on to soil moisture better when you need it mm -hmm. and so that's why we start to see just more of an even keel crop with less of those ups and downs and that's what we really want. Yield is important to us and we don't know yet you know we're still measuring it out so we're still hoping we're gonna find that happy place where we can do the more and more no-till and low-till and be happier with the quality and be happy with the yield as well because you know the feed is critical to our success. Every year Mother Nature's gonna throw something at us that we're not ready for. It's not gonna be a 100% success story every year, but it's definitely that trajectory. We're headed in that direction. Even if it takes some getting used to, no-till is here to stay in Vermont. And before long, what the neighbors might be asking is why a farmer's field looks so clean. In Bridport, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, Kirsten is joining us in the studio along with her colleague on the Champlain Valley Crop Soil and Pasture Team, Rico Balzano. Thanks so much for coming in, both of you. Thanks. So is a switch to no-till planting about changing minds as much as it is about changing ways of doing things? It's a really great question and most definitely. I mean. Vermont is, can be a really challenging place to grow corn already. Mm -hmm. and, um, and farmers have really figured out how to do that really well. Um, and now they're sort of having to change completely how they do that um, and learn completely new systems and techniques um, and, and just be innovative and, and adaptive. So. And so, Rico, what sort of investment does a farmer need to make to incorporate no-till planting? Because everything is about the bottom line. Right. Well, certainly they're going to have to... Um, either upgrade the planter or buy a whole new no-till planter. And that would be a, a, a bigger upfront investment. But hopefully over time, they can, um, as they move more and more into a no-till system, uh, either move away from some of the big tillage implements that are pretty costly or, or not replace them when, they, when it comes time to, to replace them. So hopefully over time, it'd be more of a shifting of the investment and hopefully not as much money tied up in equipment, but um, at least fewer pieces of equipment. And so how big of a risk are farmers taking who are investing in no-till then? Well, anytime you plant the crop, it's a risk. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, there, there's always a risk, but it, as long as um, they do a little bit of homework and they have the right plan and uh, equipment is set up properly, it shouldn't be any more of a risk than planting corn already is. Mm -hmm. it's a, it sounds like it's been pretty much a success story. So why haven't no-till practices caught on sooner, do you think? Yeah, I mean, they're not all success stories, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we like to show those on TV, but mm -hmm. they're not always the, the, what happens. And, you know, 20 years ago, you know, farms have tried no-till um, and they had failures. And so they, they've seen those failures and, and are, it's fresh in their memory as long ago as, ago as it was. Um, but we're bringing this new technology, new information, and we're really starting to see those farmers make it work. And, and now we're seeing, you know, as they do a little bit, they'll do a little bit more, and then the neighbor sees it, and they'll do a little bit more, and, and then we're seeing more successes and then more adoption. Right. Talk a little bit about that as far as what the neighbors see and how important that really is when it comes to sharing this sort of technology and, and uh, making sure that it is successful for folks. Certainly early adopters are important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once you have a, uh, uh, somebody who's successful in, in the neighborhood, then other people definitely see that. And just the reverse side is when you somebody who's not successful, then everybody also sees that and maybe is a little bit more cautious 
about going into it. And with Extension, our role is to try and bring those farmers and neighbors together to look at it and talk about it and then kind of troubleshoot it and figure it out. And we've seen really good success with that, working with groups like the Champlain Valley Farmers Coalition mm -hmm. to host little crop walks and bring people out um, and really look at it in their own neighborhood on their soil types and their you know, small microclimates and really figure it out together. So how do you think a new regulations from the EPA about reducing phosphorus levels in Lake Champlain will impact a farmer's decision to go with no-till? Certainly gets people thinking about it. Right. Um, I would say though that uh, first and foremost they're going to go to no-till because it's a smart uh, business decision for their farm. Uh, there's there's uh, definitely savings in, in time and fuel and, and like I said before equipment to be had. Um, but uh, Definitely the, the regulations are uh, part of the decision-making process. Right. And it's moved beyond just water quality. I mean, as these farmers start to adopt these practices, they're realizing the soil health benefits, and they see, again, not just the environmental bottom line to that, but the bottom line to their business. And so how does cover cropping kind of fit into that? It's super important. And what, what we're finding is that that's one of the reasons that no-till is working now, is that if you take a field that has been continuously tilled, with no cover crop and is sort of a, a, a worst case scenario and just start no-tilling, that's where we see failures. So by incorporating um, cover crops, you're kind of capturing solar energy, you know, 12 months a year instead of just a few. You're building soil health, the roots, I think Rico describes it really well, the roots are sort of doing your tillage for you. Right, they, they help break up the soil in, in, instead of the steel of your tillage implements breaking up your soil and uh, they, they allow water and air to move into the soil, which is what you really need to have that kind of movement. And um, they feed the soil biology yeah, too, which is yeah. super important. Yeah, soil health is kind of a broad term, but that's what we're all, what we're both trying to get at, yeah. But the bottom line too is that cover cropping does cost money. It does. It does. It does. It does, and if you <laughs> save, but again, if you look at it from, if you're not gonna be spending money on the fuel, to till the soil in the first place, two, three, sometimes even four passes over the field. There's a lot of time and, and fuel uh, uh, expense. And then if you put that investment uh, towards the cover cropping in sort of a different way, it's more of about moving the investment around rather than more investment. And if you're using manure, it's super important to saving those nutrients. So right. hopefully in the end, that will save the farmer money as well. And is no-till farming a sign that farmers are trying to do the right thing by their neighbors and, and their businesses? Yes, most definitely. I think we have conversation with farmers every day that are trying so hard to sort of figure out this water quality problem. And not one single farmer that I've met wants to be part of the problem. They right. want to be right. part of the solution. Right. And when they can do it in a way that makes sense for their business, it's sort of a win-win, a which, is, which is fantastic. Earlier you mentioned um, microclimates. Yes. I mean, almost every farm has different different microclimates. Mm -hmm. So Different how soil you, types. Right. So <laughs> how do you adapt different plans for different soils? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is the equipment can be different from farm to farm. We get questions. I think Rico gets a call every week about what kind of closing wheels to put on the yeah. no-till planter. <laughs> yeah. And the answer is, well, it depends. Because right. if you have clay or sand or if you get more rain or less rain, um, what kind of cover crops should you grow? So it definitely play, plays a really important role in that very individualized, you know, recommendation for what a farm should be doing mm -hmm. right there in that area. And the kind of, you know, what other farmers in that area tend to do mm -hmm. is also sort of on that microclimate scale. And that's so, why decision, uh, or sorry, the, the um, uh, farmers are the best decision makers for their own farms because yeah. they know their own farms better than anybody else. Yep. And they know the soils and how it dries out in the spring and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so they, they, they can make those decisions uh, better than anybody as long as they have the right choices to, to, to choose from, I guess. So. And it always shifts a little bit, I would imagine, each year. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> the weather is the biggest variable. Just to keep variable. it interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for joining me today. Here's how you can learn more about the work of Extension's Champlain Valley Crop, Soil, and Pasture team. You can check out the website on your screen. The team website has the latest research information along with news about no-till, cover cropping, and pasture management. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.